What an extraordinary coincidence that on Racial Justice Sunday, we have a reading from the Gospel according to Mark that celebrates whiteness, drawing the connection of whiteness to things holy. At various times, clothing, thrones, hair and horses are all described in the Bible in glowing terms as white. The word black in the Bible often carries more negative undertones, especially when it comes down to translators' choice of words. For instance, dark skies are translated as black skies, as a portent of bad things. It's hardly surprising that the assertion that white is good and black is bad is long established in our collective consciousness. With Racial Justice Sunday falling on Valentine's Day this year, it also seems appropriate to bring in the young woman's declaration from the Bible's collection of love poetry, the Song of Songs, that she is black and beautiful. However, even in our excitement at this bold statement, we see that the woman then feels it necessary to explain her tanned appearance as being caused by her being forced to work in the fields, a low class activity. The class differences are highlighted. Working in the dirt and exposure to the sun is associated with a low status in society. Conversely, white things only remain white for those with the ability to stay away from earthy activities and with the ability to clean them effectively. White clothes belong to the upper classes. What irony there is in acknowledging that light can both burn and spoil, as well as bleach and make holy. Yet the point remains, generally in biblical literature, as in our collective psyche, white is good, indeed normative, whereas black is bad, indeed deviant. When it comes to colour and ethnicity, people in the Bible appear as capable of prejudice, extreme nationalism and xenophobia as the people of today. Surely this is not God's purposes. Rather, the vision of those gathered before the throne of God being from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, is a vision of what the church should be, as the body of Christ. How do we in the United Reformed Church, how do you in your churches reflect this multicultural vision of the body of Christ? On an institutional level, it seems fair to say that we have adopted many policies and procedures to ensure that we have the tools to recognise and weed out racism when we see it. Starting back in 1978, we affirmed the British Council of Churches statement on racism and in 1987 adopted our own declaration on racism. After being established by the 1996 General Assembly, our racial justice and multicultural ministry colleagues have produced many resources, things from helping churches audit how they welcome diversity to how as a church we portray diversity. And there is a network of racial justice advocates in the synods. Yet it wasn't until 2007, after having just passed a resolution commemorating the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade, a resolution was put that each church, each synod, shall appoint not less than one and preferably two of its representatives to assembly from its black and minority ethnic constituencies. Owing to a divisive debate and pressure of time, this resolution was deferred to a later point in the assembly. It was deferred and deferred until it became the very last item on the agenda of that assembly and after attempts to either defer business or make it less binding, the resolution was withdrawn. Subsequently, in 2008, General Assembly agreed to request that each synod include at least one black minority ethnic member in their group of representatives to General Assembly. And it was resolved that Mission Council monitor and report this information back in 2012. If this report exists, it is well hidden. 
with all these ups and downs, can the United Reformed Church claim that we have recognised what racism really looks like and have we gone far enough to eradicate it? Although our policies may at first glance seem to be in order, have we been slow to adopt rules and change our practices? Do you know the stories of black and minority ethnic members of our church community? Stories of our members having to fight glass ceiling after glass ceiling? Do we believe that we are a multicultural church with an intercultural habit? Or simply that some of our local churches are such? After becoming the URC in 1972, there has been a lack of visibility of BAME leaders. We have only had one General Assembly moderator and one Synod moderator who have been from BAME communities in the whole life of the URC. Has the picture that has been painted by this information shown that the URC has demonstrated less than consistent dedication to the positive actions it has declared and commitments we have made? Or could we even go so far as to question that rather than being modelling on God's multicultural kingdom, the URC could stand accused of institutionalised racism? Institutionalised racism is defined as policies, rules, practices and so on that have become a usual part of the way an organisation's society works and as a result that they support a continued unfair advantage to some people and unfair or harmful treatment of others based on race. Or are there signs that the URC has done what it can in the circumstances? circumstances, acknowledging Martin Luther King's junior quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Even with the name Melanie, which is derived from the Greek meaning black woman, I am white. The voices of our own URC BAME members may be reflected in some of what I've said, but are not quoted here. And there are many individual stories of hurt and frustration that could be shared. By what right should I, a white woman, be saying these things? Simply because we should all be saying these things. On this Racial Justice Sunday, the world is still in turmoil over Black Lives Matter, the legacies of slavery, the violent divisions in the US, USA running along distinct racial lines, and we in the UK having much to do to tackle the inequalities that have existed for so long, but it are exposed by the coronavirus pandemic. With that struggle being real in the communities in which we are grounded, it is no surprise that the URC has not yet arrived at a place of racial justice. That's not to say that we failed outright or that there is no hope. As the people of God, we are people in the world. We strive to live up to our holy calling as the body of Christ. Our holy calling is not easy. Our holy calling takes us up mountains in the fog to terrifying places where we listen to strange, unfamiliar voices saying things beyond our comprehension. We are called to set aside our usual customs and practices. For us to become the multicultural people of God, we must risk being disoriented, being thrown into confusion, in order to be able to clarify who it is we are really called to be. In the turmoil of the pandemic, in this disorientation, in the rawness of truth exposed, we can hear distinctly the realities of the experiences of BAME people in the URC, in the UK, in other countries. 
and in our own churches. If all things are going well and we are comfortable, why would we, as a white majority, challenge the status quo? Suddenly, these issues have been violently thrown to the forefront of our consciousness and what was seen as a minority issue has been exposed to the light of truth. And now we have no hiding place. Our world has been bruised and battered in this past year. Adding to the fears of the climate crisis, the situation we're in can be bewildering for those of us who've led stable lives. It may feel like these issues are almost too great to contemplate, yet there is no way to deny the truth which we know now. Exposing these historical injustices gives us the opportunity to tackle these injustices like never before. We have to acknowledge that we still have a mountain to climb, but climb it we must. We must set aside our own certainties and risk our comforts to join God on that mountaintop. At this point, don't worry, I'm not going to attempt to echo the mountaintop sermon by the preacher already quoted, as that more than stands on its own as a beacon of hope. The voice I ask us to pay heed to is God's voice from that mountaintop. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Listen to the voice, to the call of Jesus and follow him. Like Jesus, call out injustices, prejudice and falsehoods when you see them. Challenge the systems which enslave and keep people down. As Jesus listened to and helped people who were ignored and excluded, listen to and help those in our churches who are ignored and excluded. Challenge the church until it reflects the body of Christ. Follow Jesus up that mountain. Follow him down through the valley of despair. Follow him to the cross. Follow him ultimately to the new life where all distinction of race and class are irrelevant. As part of that great multitude before the throne of God, we look forward to the day when we all can join in song with every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them. In the name of Jesus. Amen.